Hey, everybody. Welcome to Losing Your Mind with Chris Cosentino. I am in Portland, Oregon, sitting with Gabe Rucker. Welcome. How's it going? Great. Uh, it's great to have you. It's always great to hang out and catch up. It is. We always, uh, we always have a lot of fun. For sure. So, Gabe, this is, it's a free-for-all, so you can say whatever you want, do whatever you want. I don't edit. Um, I say that, I try to re- remind everybody that all the time, so. Then you're in trouble. There's no take backs. <laughs> no, I'm totally cool. I, I think it, it, I one of the things that has really always excited me about you is you've never been afraid to take a chance. You have pushed limits from moment one. From the first time I met you is when I came up here. Uh, we were doing Wild About Game. Yep. I and, remember that. And then we did the dinner over at the Heathman. And from that moment on, you and I have always got on really well. And that was like, that was 10 years ago, maybe more. Prob- probably more than that. And More close around there, yeah. And I mean, I remember sitting down at the bar at, at Lee Pajon having an absolutely incredible meal. And I mean, that was, that's a, in my mind, that's an iconic restaurant for Portland. I think that is, you set a precedent and a tone opening that restaurant. And, and I think a lot of people would really like to understand how you transitioned from working for other folks, moving into management and saying, hey, you know what? I'm going to open my dream spot. I'm going to do my own thing. Because I think a lot of people are scared and nervous. And you did it. You did it on your terms. You're still doing it on your terms. True. But I also, like, truth be told, disclaimer, didn't, like, have a, like, grand plan uh, to do that. It was all by chance and accident. And... If you would have told 25-year-old me, which is how old I was when the pigeon started, to like come up with a business plan, find some money, find a space, and open your dream restaurant, I would have looked at you with an open mouth and grabbed a (laughs) shot of whiskey and said, let's just cook. Well, you have. And that, well... So you I, did. You just cooked. Yeah. So I kind of food. fell into the, I, I mean, I've told the story, but like I fell in, it was like, you know, Le Pigeon, I wasn't the owner of Le Pigeon in 2006, June, when I started, I was hired as this young kid to be the chef of a restaurant that was kind of going downhill. It wasn't called Le Pigeon at the time. And, uh, my girlfriend at the time even said, don't do this. This is a bad choice. And I was like, well, I, don't, I, I had nothing to lose because the place I was working at had closed down. I was slinging pizzas for Kathy at Nostrana. Uh, but like, not that wasn't my long game there. And um, and so I just like got asked, like I got put in a situation of like, you know, Portland 2006, 35 seat restaurant, Copper Hood already there, 10 seats built around it, you know, and it was like, see just see what you can do there's no consequences because we're already not doing well so let's give it three months and if we're still not doing well then there you go then that's it i'll go find a job and if we are then like good so i got like i got this job i'm 25 it's like i've got one other person cooking with me i think that i took like a 30% pay increase as like the one guy that was like the head chef right away. So like my paychecks were, I want to say it was like, it was like a thousand dollars. And to me, I was like fucking rich. Okay. (laughs) I was. Oh, to be young. Right. Yeah. And I mean, and I was just like, okay. But, um, what, what we did as I didn't really try and like, formulate any sort of special game plan. Um, the room of Le Pigeon looks pretty much not too, or not, not that different than it did then. We have updated it and put some nicer touches on it, but like there was brick, there was some mismatched China. Uh, it was a little bit funkier back then, but it, it was built to feel kind of French because the, the woman who was the chef there before um, had a very French influence with this uh, chef who passed away, Robert Reynolds from Portland. Uh, she, she came up with like John Taboda from Navarre uh, under this gentleman. He's a nice guy. And so I just kind of looked around and it wasn't like, what's the game plan? It was like, what does the room want me to cook? You know, like we're sitting in Jackrabbit, right? And you like have your style and you got to des- like walking in here, like, right? It's like, you design this. This is like, this restaurant is Chris. From the art on the wall to the, you know, 
the the uh, wood that says what the charcuterie and the ham is going to be like this is you but i was like this kid that didn't have any grand plan that walked in and it was like what does what does what what, what do they want me to cook in here that being said there was also not really a lot of money or refrigeration <laughs> and so <laughs> uh it was like i think at that same time that we had met i think that i think it was that trip where i had met fergus henderson with yeah you as well Mm -hmm. And that was very, very popular. And like you were kind of like known as like in the States as doing that, the nose to tail thing. It's still going strong. And like, you know, that was what, 13 years ago. It was, a, you know, th as a 25 year old kid like that, I was really drawn to that. And it's what we could afford. And it was like I'd worked for Vito, but like I wanted to push the bounds of that. And it was literally just like, what can we dream up and cook? Now it's much more, a little bit more thoughtful, a lot more goes into it. There's a lot more at stake too, but it still hasn't stopped being how far can we push? I'm not punching the envelope like I was before. <laughs> I now that. I'm jabbing the envelope, you <laughs> know, poking it. poking it very gently. I poke the envelope because, uh, but that's also, I think, one of the freedoms of having a non-Michelin starred small restaurant in Portland, Oregon. I can take way more chances. Then if I, you know, you go to these big places that, you know, are that the, on the San Pellegrino list with all these Michelin stars, the cost of failure there is so big that the, you know, the chances aren't being taken. Yeah, I think that's a, a but like, are they? I mean, I don't know. I don't go, I like, I look at, you, you look at like Echeverria, right? The, the guy who just works with, makes his own charcoal, just. Yeah. That guy took some chances. That's taking chances. You're right. I'm not the, the, not a fair but, blanket statement to make. Of course, but I think you have a very valid point when you're when you're in a situation where you just can go for it. But also, I think you, I've seen an involvement of things that you've done and where you are. And I think, but it, for me, it's like every time I go, it's delicious and it's very, it feels welcoming. The f you crave the food. You've hit the craveable nail on the proverbial head and i think that's really hard for people to do because they let their ego get in the way and you've been able to balance that like you're walking on the fence and you're going push the envelope what people want push the envelope totally what people want. and you're not falling on one side you're just kind of like you're like that kid with their arms out like oh it's like the, the, the rope across <laughs> the buildings yeah. you know you're you're getting both you're getting both sides without without making anyone feel uncomfortable. Well, I think that this day and age, and I think you might be able to agree with me as people that have been chefs or rest owned restaurants, restaurateurs for as long as we have, it's not even so much as how I do that with my creations. It's how do I mentor the young chefs that work for me to do that? Because the young chef who's coming up, who the young sous chef, because if you work for me and you're a sous chef, like one of the things that you get to do is you get to create when you work for me. And so the young chef always wants like, I want to do something that's never been done before. I've got to make this mine. I've got to do this. And it's like, you know, when you're talking about walking on the fence, the fuck the fence, they're falling over into the pushing the envelope <laughs> thing for the sake of pushing the envelope. And it's my job to bring it back because the first job that we have is to make something delicious. Correct. That's why you're at a restaurant. You're at a restaurant to have something that's delicious and you're probably there to have something that you can't cook at home easily or even something that you can cook at home but that we've taken the technique and pushed it exactly or and evolved the, the technique to make it e even more flavorful sure and that's like that right there is like right down you know we're at jackrabbit right now right down the street at little bird and that's the idea of little bird is i want i want you to walk into little bird look at the menu and be like i understand that that might be something i would make on a sunday dinner but it's not sunday dinner and i didn't spend three hours doing it but i want you to get it understand it when you read on the menu get it on a plate and go oh but that's also tastes better than when i would have made it at home whereas and that's like, special whereas like le pigeon i want you to go and you want to i want you to go i kind of don't know what the fuck this is this is a little bit out there for me and i want you to take a bite or have your eyes light up and go i don't know how they did it i don't know what it is but i really like it i'm going to take a picture of it and i'm going to tag my friends or whatever, you know. Yeah. And that's so perfect example. You came down to do the travel Portland dinner 
what was that? Six months ago? Uh, probably a year, but sure, we'll say six Does months. It, it, it was long and well, I don't know, but yeah. Really? God, man, it's going by too Time fast. Time goes by too fast, right? It's because you have kids and you grow up. Yeah, we got old. Yeah. God. And I think the thing that caught me off guard that, I mean, I knew you were, what we, you know, what the game plan was, but then you said passion fruit au pois. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, I, in my head, I was like, okay, I'm trying to process it and I'm thinking like, is he going to use? You got a good memory. It's like cracked black peppercorns. He's using green peppercorns. How's it going? How does this work? And then I tasted it and it was just like, oh shit, I get it. Like it was so bright and so unlike the classic, which can be very burdensome heavy, yeah. and heavy. And it really opened. It was just like, Ugh, damn you. <laughs> damn you. Like if being the light bulb goes on, it's like, how does, how do you rethink? What, what I just is. had that moment. I was eating it. I was just in Austin and I was eating at Commodore, which is Philip Spears' new restaurant. Yeah. And the chef came out and he's all, and this is, I can't remember the dish. He's like, it's topped with Mexican furikake. And I was like, fuck you. you <laughs> Mexican furikake? Damn it. I want to make Mexican furikake. Next up, Portland furikake. Right? I know. But now I'm like, but no, but now I'm like, I'm in the kitchen today and I'm thinking about stuff and I've got this like foie dish I'm working on that's got some Spanish leaning a little bit. And I'm like, I wonder if I could make Spanish for a cake, you know, which is essentially just like delicious cultural crispy shit. Yeah. Make a romesco for a cake. Yeah. And I mean, I even asked him, I was like, is there seaweed in it? He goes, no, nah, it really is just like corn nuts with like spices. And I was like, yeah, but that works. I get it. That's, uh, it's a great play. But that's the play on words and the classic. It Boom. makes it's a right. But that's that moment, right? Like. That we as chefs and peers and people that respect each other that we have, right? Like you have never in your thought like passion fruit au pois. No, because I love au and, pois. And when I suggested that, my cooks were like, I don't know. But I'm, luckily they're like, and when I give them the look, I'm like, trust me. They're like, okay, great. But like we get to share those moments, right? Yeah. It's I, taste memories. That created a new taste memory for me that I still keep going back to. And I'm just like. Damn. And I got to have that same moment eating at uh, Costco the next night when I got to eat the whole roasted pineapple. And it was just like, you <laughs> that know. That thing's a monster. <laughs> but it's so fun. And it was just like so many layers. And it's like, I love pineapple. I love pineapple and dessert. I love pineapple Do you really? Savory. Are you a big pineapple? I didn't know that. Yeah, I do. I think it's a fun ingredient. Um, and... Just like watching it that night, I, I was like, oh man, and then you put it in the wood fired oven and it's like hot pineapple and it was just like <laughs> with the, the ice cream in it and everything. And like, you know, we have those just those, you know, when you go out to eat, there's a, and then there's a fine line between being inspired and just straight stealing, you know? Yeah. Re research and development is actually, R&D is rip off and duplicate. For sure. But there's, you can tell you can easily go into a chef's restaurant and tell when they're like looking at art culinaire and like, you know, <laughs> I haven't looked at it. And look, when was the last time you looked at one? I of those? get it still. Do you really? Yeah. I haven't got one in a long time. Yeah. Looking at art culinaire or uh, 11 Madison Park's Instagram feed or whatever and just like duplicate. You know, you can see yeah. that. People are inspired by something that's and visual. It, it, yeah. And that's like bland and vanilla. But it's not, vanilla gets a bad rap because it's delicious. Um, but then you can see like what, like what we're talking about where like, I would love nothing more than you to be like, have me do that dinner. And like now two years down the line, be like, we're going to do roasted chicken with black pepper, passion fruit sauce and have it, be, or so, you know, have it be because we did that. And like, I want that. Maybe one day I want to roast a whole pineapple or maybe who knows, maybe I figure out how to take the core out of a mango and I serve a hot mango. That would be cool. That's it. You know, I like that. But like that's inspiration. Like I am going to make some sort of non-Japanese furikake now because I ate Mexican furikake. I don't know what it is, but it's stuck with me. And, and that is, that's sharing. Yeah. And that's like the, it's a, like a taste oral tradition of passing it along. And when you're, you know, I was eating with Phil, the chef of the restaurant, and I'm sure that like, there would be no greater honor than me, like doing my own thing that was inspired by his menu. How's he doing? Great. We were, uh, did you guys go running? I did run with him. Yeah. God, you guys go running. We were down. I was actually in this is a segue, but I, it's good for. I was down in Austin for. Have you heard of Ben's Friends? You mm -hmm. that? Yeah, of course. So I met Phil the first time at Hot Luck, uh, in over Memorial Day, and uh, 
was told to get in touch with him and go running and we did and he was like hey man i want to i want to bring that to austin and so that was my trip it was like a you know 32 hour trip to austin and it was to get that going at commodore and it was stellar i mean there was like 40 people that showed up there was people that were like super sober if you don't know what ben's friends is it's a uh, uh, food and beverage uh oriented uh non-aa affiliated uh recovery group and we have one in portland first one on the west coast and just started austin and we meet once a week um so yeah phil wanted to get it going at commodore there was people there that were like hey, i still drink but i'm curious to hang out there was people there with like 10 years of sobriety there was pe- so such a great mix of people men women mexican white latino black every you know and it was just like the energy in the room and to see like myself and phil go on a a five mile run have him say he wants to do this get the wheels turning and then get the chance to go back to austin which i'm blessed because i love the city and be sit in that room and watch that happen after being part of his commodore run club i mean that was a real blessing and you know look out look out for more cities We're, we're 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 trying to respectfully grow that's a really i want to get back to that in a minute because i think there's a lot that i think people should understand like your history and stuff so like you moved you're actually from california from napa right from yeah napa. born and raised city of napa and you moved to portland when 2002 and what made you come here could not afford san francisco there's yeah. You know, Cox, what, in Kanto is just too expensive to eat at. <laughs> no, uh, <laughs> it's expensive city. I'm not gonna. I'm oh, not sure. gonna disagree. Hundred yeah. yeah, percent. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, Portland is now too, but yeah, it definitely. It's not as high. It's no, but it's creeping fast. Yeah, I don't think it's creeping. I think it's running up the. Side. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, with all the cranes you guys. But have yeah, here. I mean, I was living in Santa Cruz, and I literally was like, I can't afford San Francisco, and my buddy was like, I hear Portland's a cool city. We should go there, and I was like, okay. That's it. Yep. Done. Isn't it amazing? You can always have that one person. It's like, this is a great place. Have you been? No. Okay, but we're well, going anywhere. I had nothing. I was like, Santa Cruz was pretty boring food wise because I had a great job where I was able to be super creative, but it was a restaurant that was, you know, it's not busy. I'm, you know, being super creative to serve like 12 to 20 people a night. And um, I needed, I needed to cook for a bigger audience. That's awesome. not That was line cooking. Or what, obviously it led to something, but like I needed to get out there and do more. So you moved here, and w- w- you started to work for Kathy o- right off the bat. No, or? I got. I know I worked for Vito. Vito first. I got a job for Vito. I worked for Vito for two years at Paley's place. Paley's place. It was a ball buster back then, like two thousand two, three, four. It was like you know Vito's in the kitchen with us all the time. I'm working. You know, it was a really great crew. I just uh, you know Benny from he's yep a, yeah. So I just reconnected with him over out at IPNC this weekend. And, you know, he was like, I walk in my first day, he's a line cook, pin bone and salmon with tweezers. And I just remember, you know, great cooks came out of that kitchen. And uh, it was like that experience when you write your memoir, when you get to talk about the time when you were like way in over your head and you fake it till you make it. That was me at Paley's. <laughs> but I'm glad I had that experience. And I, you know, still to this day, I'm really close with everybody that came out of that kitchen. That's amazing. And after two years, I was I got an opportunity to be a sous chef at you know the 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 hip, bright, sparkly, glitter place with the Gotham Tavern with Naomi and Michael and Tommy and you know that was like they were like, you know I remember when that all they came were the Christian. coolest the coolest thing ever and you know, I great friendships came out of that too. Still friends with Naomi, still friends with Tommy. I mean, my Tommy and my daughters are like literally best friends. That's awesome. And so we're still super connected and that's great. But that folded. It wasn't, you know, whatever. This cosmos didn't make, you know, they didn't had other plans for you. Sure. And everybody else. And so I got like, yeah. So Nostrana was like a, like kind of a little, it was just nice. Kathy let me, you know, come in and cook and it was nice. I was there for maybe two months and then the pigeon thing kind of came around and I took the chance. Not really. Like I said earlier. So what was so what was the name of the restaurant when you started it? It was called Colleen's. And when did you turn Colleen's into La Pigeon? Did you buy that from them or no? So I got so still to this day, the gentleman, his, my our silent partner, his name's Paul Brady, one of the nicest guys you'll ever meet. He's not silent he, anymore, guys. You he, just <laughs> he currently teaches piano in Astoria. 
Uh, so he was the, the money owner of, of Colleen's. Colleen's. Okay. And he was like going on all these crazy errands, like driving to get candles up in Seattle, doing all this crazy stuff. And it just wasn't jiving. And, you know, it wasn't, a, I don't think it was a cheap build out. I mean, we have our, our hoods completely wrapped in copper. That can't be cheap. And uh, anyway, so he, so Colleen, it was over and uh, he hired, he just hired me. And like I said, I'm getting this like thousand dollar paycheck and it's like going really good. And uh, then, you know, things start, you know, I get a call from Jane Callen at Food and Wine and all of a sudden I'm, you know, a year in, I'm getting to go to Aspen for Food and Wine. And then like, I didn't even know what a James Beard list was. That's awesome. And you know, like I knew that Vito was like, when working for him, I knew that it was a th like a thing. And I remember like him like going and like, I don't think he won when uh, I worked there, but I knew that it was a thing, but I didn't know, like I never paid attention. I didn't like know when they came out. I didn't know that there was like a rising star category for like the best under 30. And so then when like someone like, you know, called me i was like hey you made this long list i was like what's that and like i don't even think i had a laptop at that time you know like <laughs> i didn't get an email address until i became the chef at la pigeon and anyway so then like <laughs> that's this, amazing like cool stuff just started happening and the restaurant uh, was doing well you know it was oh, like, yeah. i was it started doing well and uh and so then i was presented with the opportunity to to become a partner so it, it couldn't have been a better situation for me. Like nothing on the line, take over, become chef of restaurant. If it doesn't work out, I was already out of a job. I didn't leave. You know what I mean? Yep. Nothing on the line. 25 year old kid gets to cook whatever he wants. People start paying attention, saying you're cool. We like what you do. Holy shit. This is crazy. When like the one career goal that I had had in my life, was to win food and wine best new chef because when i was cooking in santa cruz i opened up a food and wine magazine and i saw grant atkins picture and he had won that and i was like oh i want that one day just because you have to pick a goal and so then like that happened and i was like holy shit and it was just like we just kept pinching ourselves you know and so then i'm presented with the opportunity to like become a partner and buy into this already successful business so it's tough because sometimes people reach out to me and they're like hey chef i'm like a young cook and i would love to pick your brain on what it takes to start a small business and i want to be like i'm i will talk to you but i'm probably the wrong person to talk to i think you're selling yourself short <laughs> i think you really have so much more to offer than you realize because i think it's amazing yeah no but i mean it's just a it's a cool story and it's like, an amazing story i mean i think it's you you followed what you believed and i think that's yeah. really that's the whole point like you're cooking what you believe in. You're cooking from the heart. You're giving taste memories. And it became what you wanted it to become. There's something yeah. to be said for that. Like you had it, you look at it and it's not like you're only focused on that goal, but you were cooking. And I mean, I went in there multiple times and you were cooking and we were talking and, you know, services happen and you're having fun and you're working with the team. I mean, when I was there, there was three of you on the line. Still is. That's it. It's all that fits. It's all that fits in there. Yeah. Unless you're like really, really small. I mean, we have a stage that hangs out over in the pantry corner, but like I, at the beginning, I'm just like, hey, you're going to be in the way. I know you're nervous because everyone's watching you or you feel like it, but you're just going to be in the way. It's all right. Just enjoy. Take yeah. it all in. Suck all yeah. the info in. So let's, I want, I want to get to Ben's friends. So let's talk about, you know, you'd got... Food and Wine, Best New Chef. Then Rising Star James Beard comes. And that was when? What year? 2011. And then you got another one. Yes. You got the trifecta. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, I guess. So you got Rising Star, Food and Wine, and then Pacific and Northwest. And then Pacific Northwest, James yeah. Beard, which is amazing. It's awesome. You pr I'm, pr pr I'm going to use the word lucky, but like, Yes. You worked your ass you were, off. Yeah, for no, it. you don't get what you, you don't get. Yes, but like, how about this? Blessed. There you go. Choose whatever word you yeah. want. Whatever makes you feel more comfortable with it. I think um, for me, I, I look at you and I say it's very well deserved because you worked your ass off for it. Appreciate it. And I think, how did that affect you? Because I think there are people who get those things and let, as you know, you have to make the doorway bigger to get them in the building. Yeah. Right. Um, I mean, I know from the outside that you didn't change one bit as a person. 
No, I didn't. Not my personality, I don't nope. think. But like, I mean, I uh, there's definitely a lot more pressure. Oh, yeah. And uh, I think one of the things, though, that I have, no matter what, like, I didn't want to be, I never wanted to be the person. I guess I don't want to be someone that people talk about negatively. I care about, like, my influence. And so no matter, I think that like the more that praise that's heaped on me, the more humble I stay focused on being because and if you're listening to this and you have a different opinion, that's fine. But um, the more, the more smoke that people blow up your ass or the more um, that people tell you that you're amazing, I think it's the more grounded you need to, you need to spend more time being grounded. When you're young and no one's paying attention to you, it's fun and you can shoot from the hip and you can be a little bit more cocky. But when you start getting more and more and people are paying more and more attention to you, you really need to, in this business, you need to start paying attention to how you carry yourself. And I was, I think doing a good job, I was staying humble. I was not, I wasn't like, I didn't get like a, I didn't go and get, try and get a big TV deal. I didn't, you know, whatever, try and. And I didn't talk to people like shit. I still made sure that I worked hard. I did what, you know, I didn't want to be one of those chefs that gets some awards and then is never in the kitchen. Um, that being said, I was not a great example because I was like drinking at work the whole time and partying and like partying with staff afterwards. And, you know, I was, I was losing it on that front, but I was keeping it together with, I was always like, Oh, I can show up to work before everybody and stay and, but like there was what was the trigger when you said, all right, it's going to stop. Cause I think for a lot of people, that's a hard, that's a hard thing to face. And that's a hard moment. And it's, and if you want me to shut up and you don't want me to bring it up, that's no, fine that's too. Fine. No, I think it's, I think it's a tough subject for a lot of folks. Um, you know, people don't like to talk about mental health. They don't like to talk about um, addiction. They don't like to talk about a lot of those things. And I think they're really important, well, valid I mean, things like, that need to be talked about. Right now, it's like the most comfortable time that we can talk about it. And it's, I agree. it's out there. For me, what it was, I, I, <laughs> I wish it was like I became a father. I super, super wish that I could sit across the table from you and be like, well, you know, I found out I was going to become a father. I took a look at things and I realized that I better get my act together because I'm going to be a father. But what it really took for me was to have that happen a second time. <laughs> <laughs> you are amazing. Because <laughs> be, and, 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 you're and, outnumbered. <laughs> and, and, and it's true. And I'm lucky because I've talked to my kids about, you know, I go to meetings. I'm, it, I got sober in AA. I go to meetings and I, I just, you know, explain to my kids, Hey, I'm going to Austin. Cause I'm going to start a meeting one, like kind of like one of those meetings I go to. And my son who just turned eight, who has seen me drink, but also doesn't remember it because I, you know, he was like two and a half when I did get sober. So that's a plus. Uh, but I wish I, one of my regrets is that I would have like been one of those people. And I always like, when you hear people, like, I'm going to have a kid. So, you know, I got to clean up my act. You know, I didn't, I was like, I'm going to have a kid. And that's just like, I can throw another shrimp on the barbie and I can still be me. I can still just be Gabriel Rucker in the life of the party who, you know, goes out and does drugs and sneaks in and goes to sleep for two or three hours and then gets up and like does things. And it, it took like, you know, this fucked up dinner party, like really where like we had these neighbors, we had just bought a house, new house. And we had these neighbors over that we didn't really know. And they were like pregnant. And we had my, my daughter, my second, who was like a month and a half old. And we were like, well, can we have kids come over we'll show you what it's like. And like, you know, three bottles of like red wine in and then more and just like, it was my like I'm a fucking mess moment. My wife was mortified, and then the next day it was just like I luckily, whatever that that straw because there was a lot of nights like that, but that was like the straw, and I stayed awake all night. You know, my wife didn't want me in bed with her, so I had actually slept in my kids' room. She was circled the wagons with the kids. I was like, fuck, what, fuck you, you know, and I just stayed awake all night that night, and like, luckily something clicked. I 
don't know what it is, but something clicked. And that was like the last, I don't remember my last drink. But you because I was fucked moment. up. Of course. But like that night was my last drink. And you've been sober how many years now? It'll be six on Halloween. Amazing. It's somewhere around, it was somewhere around Halloween because I, I went to AA, stopped drinking, but then I was like, people don't really just get off of work in restaurants and not get fucked up. And there was like these like green ice cubes of marijuana butter that a roommate had left in my freezer. And so I like got home and I was like, well, you probably do that. And so I would like gnaw off some weed butter and then I would have buyer's remorse about it. And then I would make myself throw up. And so I did that for a couple days. So I just picked Halloween because it was an easy date to remember. And it's a fa- like kind of a kid's day, it's you know? It's a family, family So event. now every Halloween, I just don't work on Halloween. I go in the morning. I take a chip at my AA meeting. I chair the meeting. And then I you know, take my wife out to breakfast. And I make sure that I pick my kids up from school that day. We get dressed up. And it's a day that like I, it's not for me, but I get to enjoy it. But I make sure that like I that that's a day that's 100% family. Because that's what like making that change is about. I also still have my businesses because it, that it, because fi- five more years of doing what I was doing probably wouldn't be sitting across from me doing this podcast, at least about like that great time that we had cooking with Passion Fruit Poivre in San Francisco. I cook better. I manage better. It's amazing to think that <clears throat> for so long, for so many, that's the norm. And it's still the norm for a lot of people. For sure. And, and I think a younger generation doesn't understand that there's nothing wrong with not doing that. But yes, but we're trying to, like, I'm trying to, you know, and like Anthony Bourdain, God bless his soul, but like he wrote the Bible for, I did for, for, for us. And it, that Bible said that this is what you do. And I know. so I was all in and then I couldn't get out. There was a lot of us that were all in, you know, and it was like thought that that was, you know, it's like we didn't work. I didn't work in New York. I never got to work in New York. Like I would do events in New York, but I never got to work there. So I thought that that it's like, man, I'm going to try. Going to go for the gusto. Yeah. You know, and I think people really. It it was a game changing book. I mean, I remember I, I would still I still suggest it for young cooks to read. Yeah. But with an asterisk, read it. And then talk to me about what I think it really takes to be successful in this business these days. Read that book and enjoy it. And let's take some things from it, but let's not take everything from it. That's a good point. Really good point. But these days, like we used to brag about like, and it still happens, I'm sure, you know, but we used to brag about like, uh, fuck, I only got fucking three hours of sleep. I'm so right. hungover. And, but I'm still work. I still did 14 hours of, I did pump. a double. Yeah. Two doubles did. But now it's like, I mean, culturally, uh, and it, this isn't in every kitchen, but in mine, I made, I've made some changes and now it's like, man, I, I did a double last night, but I still got up and I ran the waterfront loop and did four miles, well, you know, or, you know, I used to look for like parties to take, like to go to with people that, you know, let's go, let's go do this event and we can party real hard and, you know, we'll go to the bar beforehand or we'll drive out here drinking forties or whatever. And, you know, now I'm taking the CDC of Le Pigeon and because there's no like fun food events to do right now, it's like, Hey, why don't you do this cool run with me? And we're all, you know, all in there's more sparkling water drink as shift drinks at uh, Le Pigeon on any given night than beers or wine. It's amazing. The shift. It's really, it's awesome. I yeah. mean, there's so many people making the shift and I think a lot of people have, um, a tough time like I, I i had to stop because i can't drink alcohol with mental health medicine good you shouldn't d- do that <laughs> i mean we all know i'm already crazy so i take medication to not make me as crazy but then when you mix the alcohol with the pills it makes Just you super fucking crazy way downhill right way downhill fast and it's a you know Somebody's like, I didn't realize you had a problem. And I was like, okay, that's fine. It's, it, I just, I can't. I can't because it will affect the rest of the things around me. Yeah. And it, there's moments, and I'm sure, and you tell me, 
I don't feel comfortable uh, at events and things. I mean, I drink way too much sparkling water. Yeah, if they came out and were like and said like that sparkling water had some sort of negative health effect, I would be like, that would be just like a, I'd have to take a week to get over that. It's because it's rough because you, you, I drink a lot of it. It's the best. Yeah, I drink way too much of it, and I think um, my wife said to me the other day when we were out, I think you just drank three, you know, four liter bottles of sparkling water with dinner, and I'm like. Well, you know, yeah, hydrate, you know, still, <laughs> still cheaper than a bottle of Rombauer. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, but, so you have, <clears throat> let's talk about the, the, the Gay Brucker day and with the different restaurants. Cause you have Lee Pigeon, then yeah. came Little Birds. Yep. Right. And now your newest. Canard. Canard. Yeah. Which is super fun. That's good. That's, that, that is you said the right thing. We want canard to be fun. It's super fun. We want it to be whatever you want. It can be it can be kind of fancy if you want to buy expensive wine. But yep. like, what I really just want is canard to be fun. Like and that's th- the highest praise that can be. It is. It's super fun, and it's small, and it's right next door to. And you have people wait sometimes over there to get yeah. drinks. And was that the original thought? Like having? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that was. But what's ended up happening is like. Um, cannot like la pigeons now like having a like a little bump i've noticed because people will like just come to the spot and if there's like because la pigeons business we're pretty much always booked out but we have 10 seats that goes around the chef the kitchen as like the chef counter and those are walk-ins only and like that's the make or break is like how well those are filled in and constantly fill that's like the difference between like 75 and 85 covers a night you yeah know? and so by having canard people will be like oh well, let's go down to canard and then they'll look and they'll be like oh well there are two seats available at pigeon i haven't been there in a while like and just like having those like quick fills or like hey let's go to pigeon see if we can get some seats yeah, i know it's kind of a long shot oh we didn't get seats that's fine There's we'll go canard. to this delicious restaurant right next door and i think that they, they've both really like given each other help What's good because you're not cannibalizing from yourself. You're, no, well, you're, I didn't know. I, I didn't. Other. I didn't know at first. But you're doing because it is kind of you know opening something next door. It it could go wrong. It can go wrong. That's true. But you're doing breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Yeah, we're open from eight in the morning till midnight. Till midnight. That's a long day. It's a long day. One of the things at Canard that I'm the most proud about, because in Portland it's tough, is that we're open till midnight. We're actually open till midnight. The menu doesn't change, and people go in there. That's huge. Because a lot of places in Portland are like, we're going to be open till midnight. And they're not. And then three months in, it's like, we're open till 10. The sidewalk does roll up here pretty early. Yeah. Is that, I mean, it's the same. Napa's even. <laughs> Napa's well, eight, I'm Napa's sure, yeah. 830. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, and, but I would have, you know, when I first, when I, you know, when I first came to Portland, I was really surprised that there it, there wasn't as much late night dining. Yeah, I, I, you know, but do you know part of it is because the OLCC, the Oregon Liquor Control Commission, uh, you have to serve food if you're a bar that serves alcohol. So you can get a fucking burger and fries at almost every bar. So like, if you're just like, oh, I'm wasted, I need some, you know what I mean? Like, like there wasn't even like a sizzle pie, like late night pizza place for a long time, really. Because every bar just had food. So if you were out drinking, like those. You wouldn't even be, have to leave the building. Let's be honest. Most people that are eating around midnight, are there's wasted. alcohol involved. Yeah. Uh, or that's, or it's industry folks getting off work. Or it's industry folks getting off work. Yeah. You know who's a, a big, big customer of the late night customer of Canard? Is, it's the one area where I think that I benefit from this happening is the stoner. And oh. the legalization of marijuana. I'm sure. The stoned individual or group of stoned individuals who come in for like an epic amount of half price steam burgers. Oh, really? And what, you know what? It's going to happen and, and I'm fine. We, well, yeah, I'm, it's, it's all good. <laughs> because it's kind of it's stoner food. Yeah. Chicken Dude, wings, steam burgers. Like, yeah. I love the duck stack. Right, yeah, pan, d- savory and sweet, like that's oh my gosh, shit, that you know? is really good. I, I love that stuff, though. I mean, I think there's that's fun. Like you crave it; it's fun. 
you can, it's a great conversation piece. They're like, Oh my God, I can't believe he's doing this. This is so great. You know? And it's, it's awesome. Like that's what it One should of be. The fun, like with Canard, it's nice. Like they're all, you know, all different. You have multiple restaurants, right? They yes. all have a different personality and a voice. The one of the fun, like pigeon, there's always got to be pigeon has to like do that thing where we, you know, like I said, we don't punch through the envelope, but we poke it, you know? Yep. And it's got to be a place that someone can come. A lot of people come from out of town and they come and they hear about it. And so it's got to be something that like impresses in that way. Like kind of like fine dining it. At Canard, we're just taking shit that's like pretty played out. At one point was cool and it became uncool. And then not worrying about what people say about us doing the shit that used to be cool, but it's not cool anymore. So... Like it's an like, example. Give me an ex- give everybody give me an example. Like uh I don't know, like fucking tuna tartare with wonton chips. <laughs> I love you know, that. like it's that's like, amazing. Like, why are we not and we're just frying wontons? It's like not this, you know, th- it's like it's not like you're not taking shrimp, cooking it, chopping it up, dehydrating no, it, like, compressing it with tapioca, then steaming it. <laughs> no, no, it's just a fried wonton chip. Or, um, oh man, of course you asked me, so I don't have a bunch of good examples, but, uh, just it's, there's, it's, it's the, the only, it's, if it was good, if it's just tastes good, it doesn't have to have like, but by doing that, by not worrying about it at all and kind of, it's almost like thinking about like cheesy stuff, like, but by not worrying about it at all, it's kind of found its own voice of food, food. That's funny. You know, it's, it has kind of become an original thing by like and we're not like you know looking through like you know i'm not looking through like jean george's and being like oh what the the fucker do with lemongrass and (laughs) and so you know but like it's just like that's awesome it's just like whatever like catchy things but see that's what i mean every like i said everything i've had has been delicious and fun but you put a spin on it it's not just like Okay, here's tuna tartare with fried wontons. You sure? It's like that did come with edamame, guacamole, and like yeah, but it's and, hyper yeah. delicious. And yes. I think that's the that's the key thing. You just push it. You're pushing the envelope next door, but you're pushing what everybody knows to the next level at Canard. Yeah, and Canard. Yeah, Canard is like maximum. Like it's yeah, it's a it's a flavor punch. It's suit and then and a texture punch and then Little Bird is and then Little Bird is we've just kind of we did a little remodel. Uh, I've got a new chef de cuisine down there. This uh, gentleman named Nestor. I've got a great team down there. And Little Bird is like you know what what the restaurant that at the most people come up to me on the street and tell me that they love is is Little Bird. It's really? super yeah like and like Le Pigeon and Canard definitely get more of like the Food Line magazine the bling and the the glitz. Little Bird is like the most dependable, you know, you can probably the get in. sandwich dude is the bomb. It's not on the menu anymore. Oh. oh, that was my favorite. It is good. It was good. It though, was huh? so good. So good. Um, but Little Bird is, like I said, I want it to be that thing that you look at and you're like, I can wrap my head around what this is. There's no secrets. Just solid, delicious. delicious. And a little bit cheaper. You still get a white tablecloth. You still get great service. You get nice bread and butter. But there's no, there's no like you don't need to teach somebody or educate them on what it is because exactly they walk in. Oh, I, that I sounds want, great. I haven't had that. I want it to be time. super accessible, and I want to go in and like we're just you know like I said, uh, the chef Nestor's working on like a new duck dish, cream corn, chanterelle mushrooms. That sounds great. Plums. Like, like, right? Like, but that it's not great. like, like if you're doing that at like, at Canard or at Le Pigeon, like, what's the thing? What's the thing we're going to do to it that like <laughs> is the thing, right? Um, what are we going to do? What are we going to do to the corn that we haven't done before? How are we going to like do this, you know, but it's very freeing at Little Bird to just be like, let's just make some really good fucking cream corn, fold some nicely roasted chanterelles into it, put a really well cooked duck breast over it. Done. And a nice sauce. <laughs> that's perfect. And these days, more and more, that's what I want when I go out. So how do you spend your time between all the properties? Kind of bookending. So I work Monday through Friday now, which is nice. You know, 13 years in as 
kind of my, having my own business. I've got there. The kids are in like school now, so that makes sense of the weekends. And Monday and Friday, I kind of go in early and I get home early. That's how I stay married and be a good dad. Put my, I want to be able to put my kids to sleep more days a week than I can't. And then I am currently like Tuesday night at Canard, Wednesday night at Little Bird, and Thursday night at Pigeon. It's awesome. And, you know, when I'm at, like right now, so I'm doing this podcast. It's right down the street. But it's my night. I'm at Little Bird. I'm in the kitchen. I'm not like working the line. I'm in the kitchen. I'm actually, you know, working on create, being creative, working on whatever, you know. But I'm, that's my day where I just am devoted to being at Little Bird. Same thing. Tuesday, I'm at Canard. I might be working the line. I might be in the back doing prep, working on stuff. But I'm just, that's Tuesday, I'm at Canard. But Thursday, like, I'm working the line, I'm running the line, I'm writing the tasty menus, I'm line cooking at Le Pigeon, and I will do that until my knees and feet give out because that is, that's full circle. That's what got me there, and I will always do that one to two days a week because that's... I don't think I could see you not doing that. That's just like, it's my baby, and I, it's what, it puts the biggest smile on my face it's my longest, hardest day, but at the end of it, you know what my favorite thing to do is? Get down on my fucking knees and open every single box in the walk-in and organize the shit out of it and go through it because it's just my baby, you know? I love it. And I'm just... You don't hear that anymore. People, I, I feel that so many young kids, young generation, want to be the boss, Right. Because they see the boss being... That's because they don't know what it takes to be the boss. It's a lot of fucking shit you got to deal with. But yes, you're right. It's a lot of crud, right? Yeah. And I keep telling them to enjoy the moments of cooking. Enjoy that freedom of cooking. Because the farther up the ladder you go, the less of that cooking on the line moments happens. And and I think they see it as, I want to be there, but they don't realize they don't get to do that as much. And that's the part that makes me the happiest, that makes me smile the most. Right? Like your day when you go into the kitchen and you just get to cook food and like... No, no phones dish, ringing. No, no dishwasher bro- calls out. The no, refrigeration no. doesn't break. Yeah. Your oven is holding temp within 25 <laughs> degrees of what it says it's going to hold. Exactly. And the Vitamix blends things. It does. Yeah. Nobody's broken anything. There's nobody like... You don't have to... Oh, And God. you're just actually chopping things. You're brunoing things. You're searing it. You're picking yeah. things up and you're putting butter over a chicken breast and basting it or whatever. That's you all know. I want. And that's... And that's... And that, I get that every Thursday. I, I... I... And your phone isn't... Well, your phone rings. You just turn my, it off and you hide it. My phone rings, but like, you know... Kind of hide it. It's just, you know... And I'm... Do, yeah, and I'm doing it these days with such a clear fucking head that... um it's just, you know, I used to like, I used to want to get out of work to go to the bar and get fucked up. And now I can't imagine going to the bar. So I stick around and I like extra organize thing. And it's like, I walk away feeling so good. Not every time. That's an, un, that, you know, that's unreasonable. But nine out of 10 Thursdays, I would just walk out of the building just feeling great. Cause I just got to do from start to finish the job that I have done for the last 13 years that I only get to do once a week these days. But it's what I did when I was 25 starting the restaurant and I'm still getting to do it. And it feels really good. It's really nice, Gabe, to see you be so happy and in such a good place. Trying every day. I mean, we, it's like, I was talking to Tatiana and I told her, I was like, hey, I'm going to sit down with Gabe because I think this is going to be a lot of fun. She's like, that's going to be rad. Like, you you have always been fun, but you bring fun whether there's a bottle or not. I think you bring more fun now, I, and more smarts now than ever. Because the time when you, like, the two times that we've been doing all these different events, like, all right, I think you were right. Well, I think it was a year ago. I think it was September ago. And then the other time we did, we, that was two times you've come down. And we've yeah. done events in like a year apart. It's past two. It's been so much fun. It's when your book came out. You did an event yeah. with us. You know, you've done it at, at Coxcomb and Encanto. And every time we've done something, it's been super fun. And the staff loves, we all love working together and we're all cooking together. That vibe that you bring with you of, of loving the craft 
and making people smile is it permeates. Well, that's because you have that too, though. It's easy to be, you know, that, and we're because we're similar. We're both. I think you're a little louder than I am. I'm which, definitely which louder. Which is than like you. tough, but um, like you make me feel welcome in your restaurant. You're like you know, the worst thing that could happen is you could travel to cook with someone and they could act like they don't really care what you're doing. And when you're like, hey, guys, check. This is Gabe. He's from Portland. If you don't know his restaurant, Slow Pigeon, we're happy to have him. Check out what he's doing. Go watch. Go watch what he's doing. Pay attention, motherfuckers. Like, he's here. Take advantage of it. You know, like, like when make someone feel at home when they're in their kitchen. And that's what we were talking about earlier about, like, how do you want to be perceived? You want to, you know, like, we get along great. The energy is great. But, like, you make me feel at home. And you make me feel like I'm wanted in your kitchen when I'm a guest in your kitchen. And you make me feel like I should be there. And like, I mean, you're a fucking big deal, man. No, you're, not really. Sh- hey, let me say it, okay? You are. I don't, like I don't. all the kids at Little Bird, I was like, well, they're like, what are you doing? I was like, I'm going to do a podcast with Chris Constantino. Everyone, what? Really? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> That's whatever. But, but I, you know, but like, to, but that being said, it's like, but you also make me feel like when I'm in your kitchen, like I got something to share with you. There's, and I think that's the most. And your team. And I think you you have so much to share with everybody. And I think, you know, what you're now doing with Ben's friends, last year's... I want you to talk a little bit about last year's dinner at Feast that you guys did. We're good. We're doing it again. And you're doing it again this year, which I'm super psyched about for you guys. Yeah. Um, I didn't get to attend because I had an event that evening. So um, it was... What was the title of it again? Zero Proof. Zero Proof. Super awesome. You had... Uh, who it was Andrew Zimmern, Andrew Zimmern, Michael Solomonov, uh, Sean Brock, Gregory Gorday from here in Portland, and myself. So it's pretty pretty solid lineup of yeah chefs who are all in recovery, cooking together, doing a non alcoholic. And we had Ed, uh, Evan Zimmern, who uh, is in D.C. now, who was a Portlander, doing who's also in recovery, doing the drinks. And so it was. I I kind of like dreamed up the idea. Thought it had been done before, but I was uh, Andrew Zimmern was in La Pigeon filming a show, and uh, at that point, because it's Alcoholics Anonymous, he like pulled me in the bathroom, which everyone could see. I don't know what they thought we were doing. He's like, "I want you know, talk like, hey, we're one of each other, you know, like, how's it going? What's up?" And I was like, "Cool." And then I I, I was like, "Hey, I just have this idea," and I kind of used him as a sounding board. He he just like. Thought it was the greatest idea and immediately like, the dude's fucking busy okay if that dude's tried to busy e- if you've ever tried to email him like he's fucking busy he's and a so, t- he's and, and, man moving and he was just like i mean like i don't care i'll be there this is the greatest and so that's when i knew that we had a good idea reached out to uh, michael sean um and it was amazing and it sold out in two seconds people you know were paying the price that they would for dinner with wine and it, the 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 room people were moved it was amazing and so uh i thought that portland we like to think of ourselves as being pretty progressive and when i told the feast people what i wanted to do i said hey this is a food festival food festivals are shit shows with alcohol let's be honest i used to go to them because of the party not the event i was going to do but the after party and a lot of people treat it that way i think that we have a chance to do something special here in portland oregon and uh carrie and mike uh and emily were all in and it worked. Yeah, it did. And so we're doing it again this year. We've got Callie Spear from Austin. Um, we have Matthew Jennings of, I believe, Vermont now. And I think. I'm not quite sure. Yeah. He's doing his thing up in, I'm pretty sure it's Vermont. It's Vermont now. Uh, I didn't know if it was New Hampshire He's pretty active on Instagram, so you can go find him and he'll tell you about it. Um, Michael's back because Michael comes to feast. Gregory's back. Gregory's here. Um, and then this year we have... Uh, three local chefs that are uh, members of Ben's friends, all doing the hors d'oeuvres and the canapes. We've got Eric Nelson from Eam doing the um, NA beverages. I just tasted one of those uh, two nights ago. It's good, huh? It's really good. I've only been able to get in one one time. Eam's delicious, it's but I got awesome. to taste one of the non-alcoholic beverages oh, yeah. and he was tasting me on something. Oh, nice. Yeah, they're super, super good. Super good. And so it's going to be a blast. And I think, I don't see any reason why... Oh, it's already sold out. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. And I just don't see any reason why we won't be able to do it every year moving forward. I think it's great. It's yeah. And then, you know, it, because of the impact that had, uh, there's a little bit less alcohol being pushed at feast this year, be a little movement of like, 
come. We're not trying to, you know, we're not taking your booze away, but like you can make, you know, you can have a kombucha instead. It's not, not <laughs> as prevalent. And then we're also, uh, for people that are interested in a different experience, we're having before parties that aren't after parties. And we're teaming up with the, this group called the Y East Wolf Pack, who I, I actually run with some of these guys. There's going to be like some morning trail runs where, uh, they bust the visiting chefs and media out and we take them out. Like I'm going to guide people on a forest park trail run. There's going to be some yoga, some exercise classes and just stuff to do for people that are visiting our city. That's not just like the shit show that is like the typical food festival after party after party. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm, I'm just as guilty because I throw an after party, but I don't even drink at my after party. So yeah, I'm not, no, I'm not, you know, there's nothing wrong with the after parties, but we all know that they can they can, they can turn go in. after after, and then there's the yeah, then there's the the unsanctioned after parties, and you know, but the, hey, all, everything in a time and a place. I'm not saying exactly. that you shouldn't do that, but like, also not everybody wants it, and there's you know, just some new. There's sh- a time there's and new, place for everything. There's new things available. Yeah, and I think that's great, and I think you really set a tone for that, and people are looking forward to it. They're looking forward for a change. You know, it, it, it's awesome. There's so many great things to do here. You can go down. You can go run, you know, run down by the river. You can, yeah. like you said, do go for a bike park. ride. Yeah. You know, there's a million things to do here. Yeah. Other than get knackered. Yep. Which is great. So I know you have to go to the restaurant. Is I that do, correct? yeah. So I'm going to do quick fire questions. Okay. Okay. Beef or pork? Beef. Hot dog hamburger? Hamburger. Okay. Coke or Sprite? Coke. Really? I can't, I can't do it anymore. Coffee or tea? Coffee. I know. you. Have, don't you have a coffee tap? Coffee? No, I don't think so. I thought you did. Okay. Uh, nigiri, sashimi? S- sashimi. Okay. Foie gras, sweetbreads? Foie gras. Yeah, I know. I knew you were going to say that. I mean, it's going to put my kids through college, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Sweet sweetbreads ain't putting my kids through college, bro. <laughs> no, they're not. They're not. They are not. Oh my god. Chocolate or fruit? Fruit. Awesome. Gabe, thanks. Thank you very much, Chris. I pleasure. You more just, I didn't more fun than I knew I was gonna have. I think uh I'm looking forward to this year and being at feast with you and doing a lot more fun stuff in the future. Well, yeah, we'll see we'll see if I end up wearing women's clothes, huh? I hope so. All right. Take care. <laughs>